In the game D. Slagle vs. Sensor, Sensor is about an 1800 player. This game was played on ICC in 2014. We have a French defense that features the classic bishop sacrifice on h7. Let's take a look. e4, e6, d4, d5, e5. The advanced variation against the French defense gives white a space advantage, thanks to the strong point pawn on e5 that bites into the squares f6 and d6. After e5, black commonly plays c5, looking to undermine the base of the pawn chain. White reinforces the pawn chain, and after knight c6, knight f3, c takes d4. I consider this exchange to be a touch premature. This releases the central tension and makes white's task a bit easier. After c takes d4, bishop to b4 check. Again, a bit dubious. Perhaps queen b3 or knight g7 are the main lines. But bishop b4 check reminds me of the old typical beginner thing of seeing a check and giving a check. White simply interposes his knight, and after knight at gd7, now plays a3, putting the question to the bishop. In the game, the bishop retreated to a5. Notice that the bishop is not able to retreat back toward the king's side, as that path has been cut off. Also note that if the bishop takes the knight on c3, after pawn takes, white has a very nice strong pawn center and two beautiful bishops. Not to mention control of some dark squares. So in the game, after bishop a5, bishop d3, black castles. Now, of course, in castling, he's following one of the basic rules that we learn about opening play when we first begin playing chess. Castle early and get your king to safety. However, the more experienced player knows that it's not quite that simple. Here, my student played the Greek bishop sacrifice. Bishop takes h7 check. Or it's also called the Greek gift after mythology. In this case, white sacrifices material to exploit his advantage in force and space in the kingside sector of the chessboard, that is, this area over here, this quadrant. After king takes h7, knight to g5 check. Black now has a few ways to respond. The most common is to play king back to g8, but then would come queen h5. And suddenly we, we can see in this kingside quadrant sector So I consider this an excellent example of the difference between material versus force on the chessboard. From a material point of view, black has a decisive plus two, with an extra bishop for only one pawn. However, in terms of force, white has a queen, a knight, and a pawn, that is 14 and a half points, versus a rook, knight, and three pawns, 11 points. In addition, white has the bishop on c1 that's pointing in that direction, and he can bring more resources into the attack with h4 and rook to h3. After queen h5, the immediate threat, of course, is simply queen h7 mate. After queen h5, the player playing black usually has to play like rook e8, and then you have queen h7 check much stronger than simply taking the pawn on f6 check, f7 check, as we will see. After queen h7 check, king f8, queen h8 check, knight g8, knight check, and bishop check. Here, we see an additional white asset, the bishop, joining the attack. After the obligatory f6, then comes queen takes g7 mate. After knight g5 check, in the game, as mentioned, black played king up to g6. And the idea of seeking safety in front of your pawn cover is a little bit backwards in terms of chess strategy. One other option would be to put the king on h6. However, then it would be in the line of fire, and knight takes f7 double check, 
would simply lose the black queen. So after king g6, white has a couple of different attacking techniques, but h4 is the one I like. That brings additional assets of the rook and the pawn into play. Now at first look, one could argue the force count actually favors black, as he now has a rook, a knight, and three pawns, 11 points, versus white's knight and two pawns, five points. However, when you consider the additional assets that white can rapidly bring to bear, the queen, worth nine and a half points, the c1 bishop, another three points, and the h1 rook, another five points, we can see, in fact, white's force and black's lack of king safety actually give white a plus five advantage in spite of black's two-point material advantage. Thus, we can see force and king safety are much more important factors than simple material considerations. Now, back to realities. After h4, the simple thread is h5 check. And for example, after h5, if king f5, then g4 mate. That's right. Little pawns have big dreams too. And after h5, if king h6, then knight f7 check and knight takes d8. So going back, in the game after h4, black decided to try and escape as far away as possible with his queen and played bishop takes c3 check, bc3 and queen a5, trying to get his queen as far away from reach of the white knight as possible. And now white continued the attack with h5 check. And it's good to understand in these middle game motif type situations, alternative ways of winning or conducting an attack. Here, queen d3 check, knight f5, g4, and after knight takes, taking clever advantage of the pin, pawn takes, and rook g1 is considered plus 10 advantage for the white team, simply because the black king position is so bad and white has so much force aimed at him. However, I like the h5 check method of conducting the attack that my student used, because if king f5, simply queen f3 check mate, or g4 mate if you prefer. And after king h6, then the quiet bishop to d2 leaves the black king on h6 to stew. In the game, black played f6. But then came knight takes e6 check with a discovered attack on the king, king h7, and knight takes f8 check. We can see white has now converted his advantage in force into a decisive 4.0 material advantage. That is, he's up the exchange and two pawns and still has some continuing remnants of attack. After king g8, then e takes f6, a very nice pawn exchange to further expose the black king. Now, if g takes f6, simply knight g6, in the game, black decided to remove the annoying knight, but then came pawn takes check, knight takes, and h6. At this point, the evaluation is plus seven and a half for white. So let's talk about this position for a minute. With all the forces for black over on the queen side, white's advantage in king side force has reached epic proportion. After h6, White has a rook, three pawns, eight points, and additional assets of queen and bishop, 12 and a half points, while black has only simply a knight and a pawn. That's four points. And possibly an additional asset of the bishop, another three points, to take part in the king side fight in this sector here. After h6, the immediate threat, of course, is simply h7, preparing to promote again, or h takes g7, shredding the black king's pawn cover. So after h6, 
Black, quite understandably, resigned. In the classic immortal game, Anderson versus Kaiseritsky, London, 1851, White has 25.5 points left of material on the board, and Black has 43.5. However, in terms of force, space, and king safety, White has a very overwhelming advantage. We can see that in the area of the king, White has a queen, a knight, a knight, a pawn, and a bishop. So viewed in this context of force versus material, is it therefore any surprise the game comes to an abrupt end? Anderson played knight takes g7 check. After king d8, then came queen f6 check. Double exclamation point. A beautiful queen deflection sacrifice. After knight takes f6, bishop e7 mate. The black king is surrounded and brought to his doom by nine points of enemy force. The first of our two in-game examples showing force versus material is a basic pawn in-game. Here it's four pawns apiece, but on the king's side we can see white definitely has more force. He begins with g7. The black king is forced to edge out to the h-file. Note that if b5, the only other legal move besides b6, here, if I was playing black, I would highly recommend that we make this move when our opponent has gone to the restroom and pretty much hope that he doesn't know that tricky French in rule in passant. But if he does know to play in passant, say a takes b6, then after a5, you can see a pawn race has come where black is way behind in time. And in fact, after b7, a4, b8, king up, and checkmate. So after g7, king h7, once again we see the white king move in and escort his pawn home. After king f7, king h6, very familiar, similar to what we saw before, and queen g6, in your face, mate. Again, a very basic example of a pawn ending where force is much more important than material. Our second end game demonstrating the importance of the element of force is the classic Bodvinik Neidorf, Al Yekin Memorial, 1956 rook ending. At the 71st move, we can see material is equal, but a quick glance shows that the black king side sector Botvinnik has a considerable advantage in force. That is, he has a king, a rook, and two pawns versus black's king and two pawns. Botvinnik begins the process with h6, sacrificing a pawn. However, notice that the immediate attempt to promote his pawn with e7 would fail to rook check, king back, and king takes rook. However, White could have won from the initial position with rook takes g7 check, and if king over, of course king h8, rook over threatens checkmate, and after king f8, then h6, push, 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 and white should win. However, I very much like Botvinnik's technique of sacrificing a pawn to create a mating net. He played h6. After pawn takes, now for a brief moment we can see black is actually material ahead. Notice that g3 misses the mark because simply h check, king over, and rook f8 mate. So black accepts the pawn, but then comes e7. Now this is a great moment to do a relative value comparison of the pieces. After e7, we can see the white king is far superior to the black king, which is stuck in the corner. We can also see the white pawn on e7 is far superior to the two black kingside pawns. After e7, black plays rook a8. Now, the point of Botvinnik's pawn sacrifice 
The point of Botvinnik's pawn sacrifice with h6 could be seen after rook a6 check. The white rook now has the f6 square available and interposes. And then, after rook takes, king takes, g3, check, check, and mate. So instead, after e7, knight orf dropped his rook back to a8. But then came rook f6. And black resigned. Let's take a look. After rook f6, if black plays g3, then rook d6, g2, rook check, and checkmate. Let's take another look. After g3, rook d6, black could also try rook e8. But then comes rook d8, g2, rook takes rook, checkmate. The geometric moves of the white rook to f6, to d6, to d8, to e8 are very pleasing. After rook f6, black could also try to play rook e8 and attack the white pass pawn. But then comes rook d6. And after rook takes, rook check, and rook takes mate. A classic example of the importance of force versus material executed by the father of modern Russian chess, Mikhail M. Botvinnik.